Uh, thank you, Chris, and good evening or good morning, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be in the world. It is not my intention this evening to talk to you about the role of the carer, but instead I thought I would share my journey and experiences with you and allow you to decide for yourselves what, if any, help or assistance we should be giving and considering and more importantly delivering to carers during this extremely stressful and emotional time whilst they support the patient through their cancer treatment. I'll start by posing two of the many questions that have been uppermost in my mind since I became directly involved with head and neck cancer. When does a family member of a cancer patient become a carer? What triggers a change of mindset from gently supporting the patient, accepting the situation as it is, to one of direct action? Well, I guess the answer to those questions are different for all of us as we embark on our individual journey down the cancer treatment highway. So, here is my story, told briefly and entirely from my perspective as the carer and recognising that mine and Jane's personality may be completely different to yours, thereby possibly causing you to opt for alternative solutions in similar circumstances. Both mine and Jane's personal strengths and weaknesses had a huge influence in the choices we made and the manner in which we went about achieving our aims. I make no claim whatsoever that my decisions and actions to the circumstances I faced are right or wrong. They are just the choices I made at a time when emotions and stress levels were inevitably at an all-time high. I cannot in any way be described as a natural carer. I have to work really hard at the softly, softly approach. I'm much more comfortable in the all-out sort of Geronimo style. Fortunately, I am reasonably well de domesticated, so running the, uh, the home, shopping, cooking, etc. were not going to be a problem. All these things, along with driving my wife to and from appointments, just replaced all of my social activities. So my answer to the two questions I posed at the start of this presentation, when does a family member of a cancer patient become a carer and what triggers the change of mindset from a gentle supporting role, accepting the, the situation as it is, to one of uh, uh, all out action? Well, it is, I believe, simply at the moment of diagnosis. Until that time arrives, you desperately hope that he will not be cancer. And I spent most of my time talking to Jane gently of positive outcomes and minimal life impact, whilst inwardly and silently planning for the worst possible result and the potential necessary actions. So here's the first problem we carers have to balance. Displaying a cool, calm, supportive exterior to our patient whilst dealing with a volcano of emotions internally, which are constantly spewing out a lava of nightmare scenarios, not least of which may be the loss of our spouse or partner, parent, child or friend. From the moment of confirmation in Jane's case it was mouth cancer, I uh, took control of our daily lives. I managed our diary. Uh, there were going to be lots of appointments and I would be alongside her at all of them. I also took on board a lot of the household chores which had previously been abdicated to my wife. However, I was also trying to keep her active and stop her from negatively dwelling on her own situation. So it was important, in my view, to keep her involved as much as possible in normality for as long as possible. And of course, I did become her cancer-related emotional comfort blanket 
taking on board and dealing with the worst of her fears and concern while suppressing my own, well, certainly in her presence. So problem number two now rears its ugly head. Who do I turn to with my worries and my concerns? I can't help feeling that my issues are insignificant compared to hers. And of course, rightly so, all the medical contacts are focused on the patient and their needs. An occasional, and how are you coping, thrown in the direction of a carer, usually in the company of the patient, can only elicit a standard carer's response of, I'm okay, thank you. When what you really want to share is the emotional turmoil you have found yourself thrown into by this terrible diagnosis, that your loved one is not always being straightforward when asked questions by medical staff, that they are minimising what you as the carer see at home in a mistaken effort to not add unnecessarily to the burden of the overworked medical teams and that you feel you cannot speak freely in front of the patient for fear of increasing their already heightened emotion, emotional and stress levels. The carer needs some alone time with the medical staff to discuss these issues and the medical staff need to recognise that they are not treating just one patient, patient with cancer but two or possibly more. When planned treatment is cancelled for whatever reason there is an inevitable feeling of at best disappointment and at worst despair. I found myself in a scenario of three cancelled surgeries Two on the day of the surgery after being fully prepped. And as time went by, we lost over five weeks from the first planned surgery. The tumour continued to grow, visibly, on the inside of Jane's face. I felt I had to take some positive action. I could no longer accept waiting at home for a telephone call that seemed never to come. Offering us that new date for surgery. I was being drained of my energy reserves by constantly having to reassure my wife that it will be soon when I truly believed we had been abandoned. I had no one to share these thoughts, worries or concerns with. So I developed the ability to compartmentalise these negative issues and only share the positive ones with Jane. All of my negative feelings were channelled into an action plan, primarily directed towards the system that seemed OK with our plight. Our lives were on hold and time was fast running out. Make no mistake, I was angry. I felt crushed by the lack of interest from the hospital in Jane's worsening condition. I had exhausted all the normal channels of action and my anger and frustration was at boiling point. I needed to vent. I made the decision to contact the press and arranged an interview in regard to this intolerable and unacceptable situation. Two days later, our story was front page news. It took the hospital less than 24 hours after publication to arrange an appointment for my wife to be reassessed by a different surgeon who did indeed recognise the need for urgent action. And the date was confirmed with both the surgeon and senior administrative staff for early January 2019. During this meeting, I worked very hard on my self-control as I knew these people held our future lives in their hands. I actually wanted to rant and rage at them, but it would not have achieved our goal. So I was massively relieved with the result of that meeting and Jane, who had been slowly sinking into despair, visibly and mentally responded positively to the news although 
I still could not shake off that feeling that too much time had been lost. And all our plans and hopes for the future were in jeopardy. Despite a positive result, I was actually left with nowhere to target or discharge my anger and frustration. And so once again, I compartmentalised it and took it home with me. Our journey from then on followed a path that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Daily and sometimes twice daily, 30 mile round trips to the hospital. Jane was actually an inpatient for 29 days. And then planning for the radiotherapy treatment which would follow discharge after giving her time to recover from the massively invasive surgery she had already undergone. Before radiotherapy could commence, we had to deal with infection issues, which required further hospitalisation for four days, and a poorly fitted peg feed, which did not function correctly and had to be changed. Throughout this time, I spoke only of positive outcomes and how we would look back on this time as one of life's great hurdles which we had successfully cleared. All of this activity, whether good or bad, helped keep me focused and stop me from falling into a black hole of despair, although my emotional compartments were fast filling up and it would soon be time to empty the trash. My nagging fears that this had all taken too long. I pushed into one of my compartments labelled oversensitive issues <laughs> to be deleted at a later date. 30 sessions of radiotherapy were planned, confirmed in the diary, and an appointment was made to fit the mask for which a scan was required. It was this scan result that shattered my entire world. A second tumour had developed very close to the location of the original tumour and as a result was diagnosed as both inoperable and terminal. I heard all the words being spoken but I was having a massive problem assimilating them. I needed to ask all sorts of questions. I needed more information. I needed to know why this had happened. I needed to deal with this, but not right now. The shock was too much, and certainly not with Jane sitting right next to me. I needed a future opportunity to discuss with the doctors how had we arrived at this point, and where we went from here. But instead, we were almost in haste, shuffled out of a room and told to go home and await the contact from the district nurses. I was just too stunned to resist. All the fight had indeed drained out of me. I felt like I was ethereal, uh, watching myself in a, in a theatre production from a distance. Not comprehending, but somehow understanding that this production was about to lower the curtain for the last time. Quite how I managed to keep the car on the road during that journey home, I don't really know. But by the time we made it home, I had a new anger building inside of me. And one that would keep me focused until the day I held Jane's hand in the hospice. And she suddenly, but gently retired from life. And I hope started a brand new adventure. I am still dealing with my own issues resulting from Jane's diagnosis and passing but I do find the monthly Swallows meetings a great comfort not from any morbid sense but from the hope that by giving another carer the opportunity to open up and share some of their deeper thoughts and emotions and frustrations which under normal circumstances they may feel unable to speak out aloud. Together, we just might make a small but positive difference to the quality of both our lives.